keynote uh, talks, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, the first keynote speaker, Professor Moore Halgoed Balter. Uh, Moore is very well known, and while it's a cliche perhaps to say that somebody needs no introduction, uh, I think I could indeed just uh, skip uh, an introduction for Moore, or I could sort of uh, easily fill 10 minutes describing all her accomplishments and contributions. I'll keep it uh, brief though. So Moore is the Bruce J. Nelson Professor of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, where she joined uh, in 1999. She's the recipient of numerous grants and awards, uh, such as teaching awards and industry grants, but also an impressive series of best paper awards at flagship conferences like Sigmetrix in particular. Moore has uh, distinguished herself through extensive professional service to the research community, again, in particular in the Sigmetrix performance community. And she's the author of a very popular textbook entitled Performance Analysis and Design of Computer Systems. And she has also gained uh, quite a reputation through her enthusiastic uh, keynote talks. Moore has played a fabulous role in inspiring and mentoring young researchers, and many of her former students have emerged as uh, rising stars, already established to themselves as leaders in the, in the field. Moore has made uh, pioneering contributions in the analysis and design of resource allocation policies, in particular scheduling, load balancing, and power management for distributed service systems. And in my mind, um, she has really been one of the key ambassadors and visionaries in the area of queuing theory over the last two decades. She has been incredibly successful in bringing insights, model, and, and techniques from queuing theory to bear on performance issues in computer systems, and conversely, in identifying new fundamental problems arising in that context, which have sparked tremendous interest and led to very exciting uh, discoveries. Her talk today, entitled New Directions in Stochastic Scheduling, is also in that spirit, so let me not take even more of her time and give the floor to more. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Sam. <laughs> that was really nice of you. Um, and thank you, Peter Taylor, for inviting me. So I am um, from a computer science department, and this talk is based on a paper that I wrote recently that's called Open Problems in Queuing Theory, Inspired by Data Center Computing. Sorry. That's in Cuesta 2021. Okay, so being a computer scientist, all of my problems come from things like data centers, operating systems, multi-core architectures, databases. This is where my problems come from. And at the heart of all of these areas is scheduling. Scheduling is key to improving the performance of these computer systems. So I'm gonna be talking about new directions in scheduling. So just to get everybody on the same page, we're all familiar with queues, okay? And these are queues and jobs are coming in of different sizes. And you can see that the job that's here at the server, this job at the server, has an orange part, which is its age. So by age, I mean attain service. This is how much work has been done on the job so far. This is not how long the job has been in the system so far. This is just how much work has been done on the job so far. That's its age. And then the green part here is the job's remaining size. That's what's left to do. And this is just a bunch of basic terminology. And now we might have a scheduling policy. And when I talk about scheduling, I usually talk about preempt resume. You can start and stop a job. And now you see this other job starts aging. So at any moment in time, jobs can have different ages and remaining time. And throughout, I'll be interested in response time. So response time T is like sojourn time. It's the time from when a job arrives until it's done, okay? From arrival until it's done, that's response time. And if we think about this in the context of an MG1, all we do is we'll add a Poisson process with arrival rate lambda. And then for the job sizes, we're going to assume the job sizes come from some general job size distribution. And I'm gonna use the random variable X to denote the job size. So X here is the random variable for job size and the jobs can have different sizes, some big, some small, whatever, taken from this distribution. And at any moment in time, some of the jobs are partially worked on, okay? So they have some age and some remaining size that I talked about before. And the only other piece of terminology that I'm gonna need for the whole rest of the talk is load. So load is the fraction of time a server is busy, and this is just row. So row is lambda 
times the expected job size times E of X. And that row has to be less than one. So this is it. This is notation for the talk. Okay, this is all you need to remember. T is response time, X is job size. Okay, so in that context, I now ask what scheduling policy will minimize E of T? E of T remembers mean response time or mean sojourn time. What scheduling policy do we need to minimize that response time? And somebody should chat something. Someone should put something in the chat. I'm sure you know what we should do. Should we work on large jobs first? Should we work on something? Has anybody figured it out anything? Anybody chatting? You need to chat. Okay, and Sam, what does it say there in the chat? It says SRPT, answer from oh, Rhonda, goodness. Rhonda Reiter. Okay, Rhonda Reiter. So Rhonda tells us that we should do shortest remaining processing time SRPT. And this is actually a fantastic policy and it's also optimal in the worst case. So given a worst case adversarial online adversarial arrival sequence, we wanna do SRPT. SRPT is really what you do every day. You have a whole bunch of jobs on your desk, things that you have to do. And you look at the one that has the shortest remaining time, the shortest green part, so you can finish it off and get it off your desk, okay? And that ends up being the right thing to do to minimize overall mean response time. That's what we should be doing. The first analysis of SRPT wasn't until 1966, okay, by Schraga. So, um, so anyway, SRPT is a very, very nice policy, but you might still be wondering, you know, um, how good is this policy, okay? How much does scheduling really matter? SRPT is optimal, but does it really matter? So the question of does it really matter, a lot of this depends on the squared coefficient of variation of the job size distribution. So remember X is our job size distribution. And you can think of the squared coefficient of variation as really a normalized variance, variance divided by the mean squared. And for instance, for an exponential distribution, the squared coefficient of variation is one, okay? Just to give you a sense. So if the variability is low, okay? If the variability is relatively low, like an exponential distribution or something of that sort, then the difference between first come first serve and something that's optimal like SRPT maybe isn't so big unless you're talking about really high load over here when you're talking about high load, okay? And then the difference gets large. But if you're talking about a job size distribution with very high variability, okay, like C squared of 100, then the difference between first come first serve and SRPT can be very, very big, even at lighter loads, okay? So the question one might ask is, well, is there this high variability? Do we have to worry about it? So back when I was a PhD student, I was wondering about this question of, is there variability and what do job sizes look like? And I wrote this paper with a friend of mine, Alan Downey, and we looked at the job size distribution. And here's like a plot of the job size distribution. And what you see here is the tail of X. X is the job size. And you see that this tail is really a reasonably straight line on the log log scale. And this tells us that the job size distribution is a Pareto, a bounded Pareto, where alpha was approximately one. And back then, this was in 1966, I was also interested in the squared coefficient of variation and I measured it and it was about 50, okay, which is pretty high. And furthermore, I found that the top 1% of jobs, the, the biggest 1%, made up 50% of the load, okay? This is like people with a top 1% of money have 50% of the total money, okay? It's that type of a situation going on, which was also very interesting. And the upshot of all of this made me realize scheduling really matters. It really matters what you do because of all this high variability going on. So now you might ask, well, what's going on today? Well, fortunately, I have this opportunity to work with a lot of companies. And I worked on a paper with Google in URSS 2020, looking at their workloads. And again, I made the same plot, okay, of the job size distribution, um, the tail of the job size distribution. And again, it was a straight line on the log log scale. So again, I asked, what is this distribution? And this time it was a bounded Pareto, but the alpha was like 0.69, so a lower alpha. So, Right away, I imagine that the variability is probably going up. 
but I never realized how much the variability is going up. So the square coefficient of variation now is 23,000, okay, which is just astronomical, okay? I could never have imagined anything like this. Furthermore, the top 1% of jobs comprise 99% of the load, okay? So this is really unbelievable statistics going on right now. Um, and the upshot is the scheduling really, really matters. <laughs> and um, I think that's why these companies are very eager to have me come in and help them figure out how to schedule because we have such huge problems going on with this variability problem. Okay, so the outline for my talk is I'm gonna start by talking about the simplest model, the MG1, and what kind of expanded scheduling we need for the MG1 and what's going on there. I'll then move on to the MGK, K server system, okay, and scheduling in there. Then I'll switch gears and I'll start talking about what the jobs look like today. So jobs are also quite different and I'll talk about how they're multi-server jobs. And then I'll talk about malleable jobs, another type of jobs that are very common today. And throughout this whole discussion, I'm gonna switch back and forth between recent progress and open problems. So it's meant to be an open problems talk, so I'm gonna be talking about both of them. Okay, let's start with MG1. So we already talked a little bit about the MG1. So far, we assumed that we have known size. And when you have known size in particular, you know the remaining size. So we know exactly what the remaining size is, okay, of every job at every time. And that's great because we know we can do SRPT and we know that that minimizes mean response time. Okay, so everything is good. What does SRPT look like? Well, I'm gonna draw SRPT in terms of a rank function. So this is the age of a job. And here we have rank of age, which is like a priority, where lower priority is better. So if a job comes in with size five, for instance, then you can see that it's rank as it ages, goes down, 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 which is good. That means it's getting priority. So as it ages, it's rank, which is its remaining size, the rank here is the remaining size, is going down, 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 and it's getting priority. And if we have two jobs like this one and this one, we're going to run the job on the right first because it has smaller remaining size. It has lower rank, smaller remaining size. You might get another job that comes in of size three, and it also has a rank function, which is also monotonically going down. And now if you have two jobs, you again choose to run the job of the smaller remaining size, so the smaller rank, okay? So it's a very simple policy. Now, you might ask, well, what if the job size distribution is, what if the size of the job is not known? So I don't know the size of the job. So here I have a whole bunch of jobs and I can't tell which one is small and which one is large. I have no way of seeing that. Okay, I don't know which is small and which is large. So I can't do SRPT. So now if the job size distribution has certain properties like decreasing failure rate, then we know that least attained service, this policy LAS, least attained service minimizes mean response time. And this has been written up a lot by papers like Rhonda Ryder and um, Alto and Ayesta or C. Ayesta have written a lot of papers on this decreasing failure rate. It's very nice. And it tells you that the right thing to do when you have decreasing failure rate is to work on the job with the lowest age, okay? The least attained service. So if we think about giving priority to the job with the lowest age, we think about a rank function like this that goes up. And what this does is it gives priority to the job with a lower age as opposed to higher age, okay? So it goes straight up. But now you can ask, what if the job size is not known and the job size distribution is just an arbitrary distribution? It's not something with decreasing failure rate, okay? You don't know anything about decreasing failure rate. You know the job size distribution. Let me be clear. You know the job size distribution because you see jobs going through the system and you see them complete. So when they complete, you know what size they were. So you know the size distribution, but it's some arbitrary job size distribution, okay? And how in the world are you gonna schedule now? So you see the size distribution and you're wondering, whoops, you're wondering how in the world can I do something like SRPT, okay? How can I do something like, like get the short jobs done first? So there is a policy which is very, very similar to SRPT. 
okay? But it'll work when you have this job size distribution, but you don't know the sizes. Sizes are not known. What is this policy? It sounds like SRPT. It's not shortest remaining processing time. Can somebody say anything? No ideas? Instead of shortest remaining processing time, I don't know what the remaining processing time is, but I do have a distribution. So I might know the, somebody's chatting something. There is an answer from once again, Rhonda, S-E-R-P-T. S-E-R-P-T. Um, okay, Rhonda could just give this talk. So, <laughs> so that's totally right. Shortest expected remaining processing time, okay? So this sounds very good because now we're gonna use the job size distribution and look at the expected remaining time. Let's see what that looks like. So let's just look at an example. Here's the job size distribution. And we're saying jobs are either of size one or six or 14, each with equal probability. Suppose very simple job size distribution. So now what we would like to do is understand what the expected remaining size is given a certain age A, okay? So when you start, your age is zero. So your expected remaining size is the average of one and six and 14, which is seven. So your expected remaining size is seven and the expected remaining size starts to go down. Now, maybe you finish at age one, right? Because maybe you're of size one and you're done. But if you don't finish at age one, then your remaining size now is either gonna be five left from here or 13 left over here. And the average of that is nine. So your expected remaining size doesn't keep going down, it goes up to nine. And then your expected remaining size goes down and maybe you finish at six, but if you don't finish at six, your expected remaining size goes back up to eight because you have eight left on the 14 and then it goes down, okay? So what we see here is we see a situation where the rank is the expected remaining size, this expected remaining size, and we see that this rank is not monotonic. It goes up and down. And you can imagine for general job size distributions, it could go up and down a lot, okay? So we have this non-monotonic rank. And if you, that's, that's all fine. If you have two jobs here, Okay, one is of age 11 and one is of age four, you now always run the job with the lowest rank. So you would run the job of age 11. You would choose to run that job. That's what it tells you to do. Okay, but you see this rank is a complicated rank function. It's not monotonic. All right. So it might be interesting to ask, is this the best you could do? So, I mean, this is a very nice policy because it only requires knowing the job size distribution it doesn't require knowing the job size. Is this as good as you can do given that you don't know the job size? And to help you think about it, I'm gonna ask you to think about these two jobs. This one is almost at age six. It's just a little delta away from being age six. And the one on the right is of age 11, okay? So the one on the right is of age 11. And according to this policy, SERPT, the one on the right has priority because it has the lowest rank. The question is, should we run the job on the right or should we run the job on the left? Okay, now the job on the left has only a little delta amount of work to go before we can discover that it might finish. Okay, because it might just be, of a, it might just be of size six and, and then we'll be done. And that's the idea behind the Gittins policy. So the Gittins policy, which is the truly optimal policy, so it turns out SERPT is not optimal, okay? The optimal policy is actually the Gittins policy. And the Gittins policy works like this. You'll see it has a different rank function, okay? And when a job is of age like six, just before it's of age six, just a little bit before it's age six, it's rank is going down, down, down. So it's rank is zero. This is like very good rank. So it has re really optimal rank just before age one, at age six, at age 14, okay? These are optimal ranks. The Gittins function, the Gittins rank function is more complicated because it has this delta parameter and it depends on the probability that a job, see this denominator here is the probability that a job will complete in the next delta instance. 
And if it has a good probability of finishing in the next Delta instance, that's good for us. And so we might wanna prioritize that job because we can get it out of the system. Now, Gittins, just like all the others, you always run the job with the lowest rank. And Gittins, just like SCRPT, has a complicated rank function that is not monotonic, okay? So I'm now gonna talk about a little bit about just summarizing the state of the art in scheduling. This is for an MG1. So prior to 2018, we couldn't analyze response times for policies like SERPT and Gittins. We didn't know how to do that. And this is a problem because these are policies that are great when you don't know the job size or have only partial knowledge. So we couldn't analyze these. And the problem was that we couldn't handle the non-monotonic rank functions. We didn't know how to do analysis with that. The recent progress happened in 2018, and it was really due to my PhD student, Zeev Scully. So Zeev Scully came up with this analysis called SOAP analysis. You can see a little bar of SOAP. And what it does is it allows you to take any rank function. It can be a non-monotonic rank function, any rank function that corresponds to some scheduling policy, okay, some rank function, and translate it into a closed form expression for response time, both the mean and the transform. So he can get the Laplace transform of response time for any rank function. And this was really important because now we can actually look at policies that don't know the size of jobs like SERPT or Gittins and compare them to each other and also compare them to policies like SRPT that know the job sizes. But there's a lot of open problems that this all opens up. Okay, the first thing is if you saw those rank functions, you saw it was rank as a function of age. And age was very important, okay, because the rank is a function of age. What if you don't know the age? Now, normally you know the age because you see the job running, but sometimes the age is delayed, like that age information is coming through a network and it's delayed. So you don't have the accurate age. If you don't have an accurate age, you can really mess up your scheduling policy. It can become a very bad scheduling policy very quickly, okay? So we have a little bit of preliminary work on this. It's a paper called Soap Bubbles. Um, and it starts to deal with this question of what if you don't have accurate age, but I think there's a lot of work left to be done on this very important question. Another important question is what if we can only estimate the job size distribution? Like the job size distribution, normally we think we know it because we see jobs finishing, but the job size distribution could be changing over time, okay? And so you might only have the current estimate of the job size distribution. So now you have a job and, you know, we're supposed to finish. It was supposed to be 14, right? It reached age 14. It's supposed to be done, but, but it's still running, okay? So what do you do? How do you prioritize it, okay? So big open problems um, for people to work on. All right, so I'm done with the MG1. Let's make things more complicated. Let's go down MGK. So now we're going to talk about multi-service systems. So here is your multi-service system. You have K servers, it's an MGK. And we would like to know how to schedule to minimize mean response time. And I'm gonna assume for now that the sizes are known, okay? So I know who's small, I know who's big. How am I gonna schedule, who am I gonna run, okay? So um, the idea is we would like to match our single server because we understand the single server so, so well we'd like to match the single very powerful server. So notice I've drawn the single server as a big server, okay? Super powerful server equal to the size of the all K servers, okay? So we, this single server that's, that's running at the speed of the sum of the other K servers works as a lower bound on response time to the K server system because we imagine that it's running the optimal policy and it can always just simulate everything that's going on in the K-server system. So we imagine it's preemptive, okay? And it works as a lower bound. So we'd like to match this lower bound running the optimal policy. But we actually know what the optimal policy is for a single server. By now, everybody knows what this is. This is SRPT. So we would like to make our K-server system look like SRPT, which tells us Maybe what we should do is at all times run the K jobs with the shortest remaining time. 
So this is the policy SRPTK. So SRPTK is a generalization of SRPT, which at all times runs the K jobs with the shortest green, the smallest green parts, the shortest green stuff, the shortest remaining time. And this seems like a wonderful policy, okay? You know, just work on the short ones. The question is, how well does it do? So when I first started looking into this SRPTK, I was very disappointed, okay? Because the paper that I saw about SRPTK came from 1997, um, Leonardi and Ross, and they were looking at SRPTK in a worst case sense with a worst case adversary who's giving you an arrival sequence, which is as bad as possible, okay? So the adversary is getting to decide what kind of jobs to send you at every moment in time. And they found that SRPTK had this competitive ratio, which was really bad, okay? So competitive ratio is how it compares against optimal, against what would be optimal for this arrival sequence. And the competitive ratio has these terms in it. One of the terms has this N, which is the number of arrivals, which could be infinity, okay, for an online setting. And then another term has this ratio of the maximum job size to the minimum job size. And we just saw that they can be very different. So this ratio can be high. And so you're left feeling like this is not so good as SRPTK. And the reason it's not so good is that you can imagine that SRPTK is not so great at packing jobs. Like if you have these two little jobs and then a bigger job comes after the two little jobs, SRPTK tries to run the two little jobs and makes the big job wait. But maybe it would have been smarter to put the big job on one server and the two little jobs on, onto the other server back to back, okay? So you can see why it's not perfect in every, in every case, okay? What they found, Leonardi and Ross, is they also found that although SRPTK has this high competitive ratio, no other policy does any better. And so they said, well, the problem is closed. Okay, we're done. But this is very unsatisfying to people like us who are stochastic people, because we still feel like, okay, maybe that's against some worst case adversary, but we still feel like for an MGK, SRPTK should be the right thing to do. And trust me, I've done many simulations of SRPTK and it is the right thing to do, <laughs> okay? It's a good policy, okay? It's a really nice policy. So unfortunately, scheduling for the MGK is basically non-existent, okay? So scheduling is hard and now we're talking about key service systems. So the recent progress is due to a PhD student of mine, Isaac Grossoff. And Isaac in 2018 had an idea for how to think about a case and how to think about SRPTK and this MGK system. So here we have SRPTK and an MGK. And he said, maybe what we should do is when we're thinking about its response time, we can think about it relative to a single server, a single server that's much faster. So if you think about the single server, which is speed one, this is the lower bound we talked about before, okay? And you think about the individual servers in the SRPTK as having speed one over K, okay? Then the single server is a nice lower bound, but maybe we can think about the response time of the MGK in terms of the response time of the single server, okay? Maybe their response times are not that different. So what he was able to show is this first bound is that the mean response time for SRPTK, and this is the first bound on response time that exists in, in anything like SRPTK, is the same as the mean response time for SRPT1 with this additive term, okay? Now, this additive term, I can say a lot about this, <laughs> you can ask me more questions, but the additive term basically grows as the load goes up. So as load goes up, this term goes up, okay? So term goes up as load, okay? Um, but it grows more slowly than SRPT1 grows with rho. So SRPT1 also grows with rho, and this term grows more slowly than that. And the result is that you can think of this term in gray as like little o of the mean response time under SRPT1. And so now when we look, whoops, sorry, when we look at SRPTK, the mean response time under SRPTK 
divided by the mean response time of SRPT1 becomes one as load goes to one. So in the heavy traffic limit, when load goes to one, the SRPT K system and the SRPT1 system become the same. And this should make some intuitive sense because when load is high, all these servers here are occupied, okay? So they're all running at full blast, okay? And so we're doing something kind of like a single server, okay? Except not exactly because we're not really focusing on the shortest job, just the shortest job, but it's something resembling that. So this should make some intuitive sense. Now, when you look empirically, SRPTK is actually great at all loads, okay? It's really wonderful, okay? But we, we haven't proven that. So it'll be one of the open problems. Okay, so wrapping up, recent progress. Um, it turns out this paper on SRPTK also looks at a bunch of other scheduling policies, like this is the least attained service one, and proves the first bounds on it. And then Zeev Scully et al. Um, in Sigmetrics 21 had the first bounds on Gittin's K. So this is, this is now where you don't know the job size and you're still in an MGK. We're really into MGK in, in my group. <laughs> we like MGK. But there's tons of open problems, okay? So the things that we're working on right now are things like, can we get up better upper bounds when you have lighter loads, okay? That formula that I showed you is no good when you have light load, okay? It's not a good formula for light load. Can we get better upper bounds for light load? Can we get, can we find something that will give us a better lower bound than using a single fast server. The single fast server is great as a lower bound and it's fantastic for high loads, but what about for low loads? And then there's the usual, it's not a good, it's not a good lower bound for low loads. And then there's the usual question of, you know, which comes up whenever you're talking about any kind of Gittins policy is about learning the job size distribution and what if we don't have it and it's not accurate, et cetera. So I've now wrapped up two of the topics. And we're gonna move to one of my very favorite things, which is multi-server jobs. So, so far, when I've looked at like queuing books, you know, when I, and you look at jobs, the jobs run on a single server. So every job runs on one server. And if you have an MGK, it's still every job runs on one server. But today's jobs, at least in the last decade, maybe decade and a half, okay, do not look like that, okay? Jobs occupy multiple servers for a certain amount of time. So a job is a pair. It's a number of servers and a time. So just to make this really clear, okay, I'm going to say a few times, okay, here's a distribution of the number of servers requested. This is according to this recent Google Borg trace, okay? And you can see they span five orders of magnitude, okay, number of servers requested. So jobs really can come in and say, I need 500 servers or I need 1,000 servers for like two hours. That's what jobs today look like. So just to make this super clear in queuing speak, okay, here is your multi-server system, okay? And when jobs come in, they require multiple servers. That's how they work. This is what they look like. And sometimes a job comes in and it can't even get into the system, okay, because there aren't any servers left for it. And then the job, you know, was basically blocked trying to get into the system. And so you can see we don't reach full utilization, okay? So it's definitely the case that we're not reaching full utilization. So I would like to understand how to analyze these kinds of systems. Okay, so let's give, let me give you a model so that everybody can help me. So for each arrival, I'm gonna assume with probability P sub I, that it's gonna, the arrival is gonna request N sub I servers, and it's gonna hold on to the N sub I servers for S sub I time. S sub I is a random variable here. So if we go with this model, then the load of the system is we have so many arrivals per second, and then each arrival, okay, with some probability is asking for this much work. It's putting this much work into the system, N sub I servers for E of S sub I time. And then I'm dividing by the number of servers K. So this is the load. Okay, but everything to do with this model is wide open, really everything, okay? So if you look at, for instance, mean response time, 
So a few people try to work on models like this way back when, but mean response time is definitely open for anything more than two servers, okay? And even for two servers, it's complicated. If you look at questions like the stability region, normally we like to say the system is stable when rows less than one. Obviously that's not the case here, but the stability region really is only known when all the job sizes have the same exponential distribution. Then there's a closed form for the stability region. Well, kind of closed, but anyway, the stability region is known there, okay? Outside of that area, we don't even understand stability for this model. So this is a hard problem, but a necessary problem because this is what jobs look like today. So we're going to have to solve it. It's not even a question. The dropping model, which you might be used to, it turns out to be much easier. So the dropping model is something that comes up in communication networks, and it is a nice, easy problem with a closed form solution, okay? So this is a problem that's been studied by a lot of people. You know, a job comes in, if it can't get in, it's dropped, okay? But that's not what we really need now. We really need to be able to allow jobs to queue so that they don't have to try over and over and over again, okay? Although many systems do work like this, okay? Like the dropping model. Okay, so to wrap up, this is a situation, these multi-server jobs, where everything is open. I told you the mean response time is open. I told you I don't know anything about stability regions, okay? But there's even more that's confusing. So I have spent a lot of my time trying to think about what job size really means in this context. So suppose you want to prioritize small jobs, right? Because we want to do something like SRPT. So you want to prioritize small jobs. What is the definition of small? Is it the duration? Is it the number of servers? Or is it the product of duration and number of servers? Okay, not entirely obvious what you should do. Suppose you now move to policies like CIDA that separate small jobs from large jobs. So it's well known in computer systems and data centers that we want to split small jobs from large jobs. We want to separate them. If you wanna do that, separate the small jobs and the large jobs, you need to have an idea of what small means, right? Is small based on the product? Is small based on the number of servers or based on the time? I'm working with companies right now that are looking at splitting up small jobs from large jobs. And we have to ask ourselves, what does small really mean? Okay, final topic, malleable jobs. So here's where it gets super, super interesting. So sometimes, like sometimes we're dealing with a limited number of servers. So in the problem before, I just assumed you're in a data center with some huge number of servers and the jobs come in and they request some number of servers. But sometimes you don't have a lot of servers, okay? Like maybe it's a very small data center or maybe the example I'm gonna use is a multi-core machine. So multi-core machine has some number of cores and that's what it has and it's limited. And the jobs come in and you have to be very careful now about how you're gonna allocate cores to jobs because you don't have that many cores. So fortunately, jobs themselves are malleable. So what I mean by malleable is many times jobs can be paralyzed across different numbers of cores. They can make do with 10 cores, or they can use five cores, or they can use three cores. They can make do with whatever you give them. And such jobs come up all over the place. So database queries are known to be very malleable. We work with database queries. Machine learning jobs are often malleable, okay? They can make do with smaller numbers of cores. Scientific computing jobs are another example. So let me kind of, let me be very specific. What do I mean by malleable? Okay, so suppose you have a job. The job's inherent size is X. If I run it on one server, its runtime is X. If I run it on two servers, its runtime is X over two, ideally. If I run it on three servers, its runtime is X over three, okay? This is, this is the perfect parallelism, what we call perfect parallelism. So you see here, speed up is a function of number of cores and it's a perfect straight 45 degree line, okay? You perfect scaling, okay? In reality, of course, the world is not like this. In reality, we have some kind of concave function 
So at some point you stop receiving speed up as you increase the number of cores. And the run times now look like this. It's X divided by S of two, okay? So in this context of reality, which is the speed up functions that are not perfect, okay? And in the context of jobs arriving over time and the number of cores being limited, we ask ourselves at every moment in time, how many cores do we want to allocate to each job? So we are the system and we're making this decision, like how many cores should we allocate to each job to minimize mean response time? So I'm gonna ask you a question just to build your intuition. So here are two jobs. One has inherent size 10 and one is 20, okay? A smaller and a bigger one. And the speed up function for all jobs is gonna be some kind of concave function, like let's say square of K, okay? And I'm gonna give you three, no, four choices. The first one is we're gonna split the cores equally between the blue and the blue and the purple. The second is we're gonna give them all to the purple because the purple is small. The third is we're gonna give them all, almost all to the purple. And the fourth is we're gonna give almost all to the blue because the blue is large and you know we need to get it done, okay? And we would like to minimize this, the average response time across these jobs. Like, what are we going to do, okay? What should we do to minimize this? Does anybody have a feeling? Is it gonna be A, B, C, or D? Would anybody like to chat something? So remember, all the jobs have this kind of speed up function. So once you give it too many cores, maybe those cores are no longer useful for the job, okay? So you don't wanna maybe give the job all the cores because it's not useful. On the other hand, one of the jobs has smaller inherent size and one has larger inherent size. Does anybody have a feeling as to what we should do? Do we still wanna to bias towards short jobs? Okay, let's go through them since people don't know. A is treating the jobs equally. That's a little bit suspect, okay? Because they have very different sizes and I told you I wanna help the smalls. B is giving everything to the small, which is great, but after some point, the smalls aren't being helped, okay? Oh, somebody chatted something. There's what do a we have? vote for option C now. From, option, uh... C. option C is correct, okay? So option C is the correct answer, okay? We wanna bias towards the short jobs, but we don't wanna give them everything because after some point, it's no longer helpful, okay? So on the one hand, we wanna give all course to the shortest job. On the other hand, we want to give the core to the job that benefits the most. We don't want to hand a core to somebody if they're not getting any benefit out of it, okay? We don't want to hand it to them if they're at this flat point of the speed of curve, okay? So, okay, so that intuition sounds good, okay? And maybe we can come up with a formula for how to do this, all right? But let's consider another question. Now I'm giving you two jobs with the same inherent size. And again, I'm giving you the same four options. What would you like to do now? The jobs have the same inherent size. Should I now split the cores equally? Do I give them all to the purple job? What do I do? Any thoughts? So this one is meant to be very tricky. And I'll just tell you that the answer is not what you might think. It's not A, okay? It's not splitting the cores equally. The answer is do either C or D. And the reason is that once you start running a job, it becomes the smaller job, and then you might wanna to bias towards it, okay? Whichever job you pick to run first becomes the smaller job. So this stuff is very counterintuitive and requires very careful thinking about how to actually schedule these things, okay, with speed up functions. And the problem unfortunately gets even more complicated if you have multiple speed up functions. So some jobs are more paralyzable and others are less paralyzable. So specifically, before I said that there was this trade-off, you kind of want to give all the cores the short job or you want to give the core to the job that benefits the most and you want to trade off those two things, okay? But now there's a third thing that happens, 
which I call save the blues, okay? Basically, you wanna save up blue jobs. You don't wanna get rid of them. And the reason is the blue jobs are more flexible. They're more paralyzable, okay? They're like better jobs to have around. And so you don't want to use up all your blue jobs. You want to kind of hold on to the blue jobs. All right. So these are like three different things you have to take into account. And it all gets very complicated to figure out how to do it. All right. Wrapping things up. My student, Ben Berg, has basically done his thesis. Um, he's still not done. He's still working on it. A thesis on paralyzable jobs. And I would like to say that he solved the problem. Um, and if you're interested, you should definitely look at his papers. But unfortunately, he hasn't really solved the problems yet. Um, there's so many open problems. So if you think about categories of open problems, there's single speed up, multiple speed ups, known sizes, unknown sizes. And the way I see it, there are open problems in every single category. Okay, every category has open problems here for you to work on. Sometimes I've put more check marks in because you know, Ben has done a few more things, but um, basically that's open in every category. And I'm really looking forward to people working on this problem. I think this is a super important problem because jobs are paralyzable. Okay, so in conclusion, I started this talk by speaking about um, high variability in today's workloads. And it was extremely high variability, like square coefficient of variation of 23,000. Okay, and this really motivates the need for scheduling. We have to figure out how to schedule jobs and not have large jobs get blocked behind small jobs. Um, we then looked at scheduling in the MG1 and furthermore in the MGK, and we saw um, scheduling policies where sizes are known, where sizes are unknown, um, and lots of open problems related to that. We then moved on to talk about what jobs really look like and jobs today are multi-server jobs. And um, I'm really encouraging all of my students <laughs> to just try to figure out what is going on with multi-server jobs and how in the world we should handle these, how we should schedule for these. But even aside from scheduling, can we even understand mean response time in these kinds of systems? And finally, um, there are jobs that have flexible paralyzability. These are also more and more common and we really need to be looking at those jobs. So I've talked a lot about open problems, recent progress. Um, if you feel like you need to go back and understand this in more detail, I recommend just looking at the paper. It has a bunch more references. Um, anyway, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. And let's give uh, more a big round of uh, virtual applause for the fantastic talk. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm also happy to send these slides to anybody who wants them. So if you want the slides, you can send me an email and I'll send you the slides. Okay, thank you. So maybe the organizers will even post them on their website. That's uh, sure. That might be a great. I'm thing. always happy uh, to give away my slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Are there any uh, questions to more? And in case you missed uh, the very start, you can either uh, raise your hand and then uh, we should be able to uh, unmute you so you can ask the question, or if you prefer, you can use the, the chat or the Q&A function in, in Zoom. Anybody can chat anything. Uh, there's a question from Rhonda. So Rhonda, I think you should be able to uh, talk now. Okay. Uh, yes. Hey, Rhonda. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Um, you kind of hinted that you had some partial results for the malleability. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's interesting. So um, so the results, the results that we have the most work in is a situation where jobs are not really arriving over time. So the jobs are all there, they're present and they obey the same speed up function. So you have some, some same concave speed up function. So let me see if I can move backwards here. Um, let me go back. Let me go back to this picture. So, okay, so consider something like this where all the jobs have the same speed up function, but the jobs have different sizes, okay? And in that case, we actually know the exact correct schedule, okay? But all jobs are present at the beginning, okay? 
that policy, we call it high efficiency SRPT, H-E-S-R-P-T, kind of like the high efficiency dryers or something, washers, okay, H-E-S-R-P-T. And the idea there is on the one hand, you want to, let me just go back to this picture. On the one hand, you want to bias towards the short jobs, okay? But on the other hand, you don't want to give the short jobs everything, okay? And so what we have is we have an exact analysis for how to, how to split things up among the jobs. And it has some very nice properties. It has these scale-free properties and all sorts of good stuff, okay? We can take that policy and create an online version of it where jobs are arriving over time, but we don't have proofs about how good that is. It seems to work well in practice. We just don't have proofs of that. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've moved into the world where we have multiple speed up functions. So we're interested in multiple speed up functions because of databases today. So in databases, what happens is, it's actually a little bit more complicated than I explained. A job comes in, and let me move to the case with the multiple speed up functions here, these multiple speed up functions. So jobs come in, and they might have phases where they're highly parallelizable, like very near the green line, and phases where they're not parallelizable, like totally inelastic. They, you know, they can't be parallelized. So they switch back and forth between being very parallelizable and being like joins, like you know, being very sequential and parallelizable and sequential. And so you have different jobs, and some of them are in their elastic phase where they're not parallelizable, and some of them are in their some sorry, some of them are in their elastic phase where they're very parallelizable, and some are in their inelastic phase where they're not parallelizable. And so we have jobs in different places. And the question is how to schedule those. And we have some partial results on that in that arena, dealing with elastic and inelastic jobs. So it's simpler speed up functions, but we can work better in that space. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. There's one further question from uh, Sibashi's Dibar. Um, and you should be able to uh, talk now. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, uh, this uh, case server. If one of, if two of server are uh, working same, um, doing same work, then what will be happen in QV size distributions? So, so you're talking about the multi-server model, right? Yes. The, the multi-server yes. job model. Okay. Yes. So let me just let me just go back to that picture. Okay. So we're talking about here where a, where a job occupies multiple servers. Yes. Okay, and you're saying what's going to happen to the Q length distribution? Uh, if two servers are doing same work, then what will be happen in the Q size so, distributions? Okay, I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're saying, but um, suppose you have two. So what happens here is all four red servers, all four of these servers are working on the red job at the same time. Okay, and the yes. job will finish at all four servers at the same time. So they're, they're all occupied and then none of them are occupied. Then it frees up all of them, okay? Um, we don't know what the, what the Q length distribution is or what the average Q length is or anything about this. We don't, we don't know mean response time. You, you're asking me something else and I'm not understanding it. I'm sorry. Uh, actually, ma'am, if we, if, we, if we take five server and yeah. uh, in the, and one of the five server, there are two server are equal doing same work then what will be happen? Uh, so we, if we, we have a five server system and a job comes in and it takes yes. two servers and those two servers are both working on one job. Yes, yes, the yes, ma'am, exactly. The other three servers are idle. The other yes, three yes. servers are just getting idle. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, yes, yes. This is my questions. Okay, so yeah, so the other three servers are just sitting idle and they're doing nothing. That's how it normally works. The, the job that came in asked for two servers, it holds onto two servers, and the other three servers are idle. In the case of parallelizable jobs, you could maybe have a job that used all five servers. But in this multi-server job model, the job requests the number of servers it needs. And if it only wanted two, then that's all it's, that's all it's gonna get. Okay. okay, so maybe that's in view of time that we should uh, further take this question uh, offline in some way, uh, if needed, uh, and take uh, just a brief break, uh, and then uh, we'll uh, start with the next uh, talk by uh, Peter Glynn at the top of uh, the hour. And thank you again very much more thank for you. the excellent uh, talk. Uh,
You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so we'll resume in just a few minutes. Sharing, um, if, if